Hello, everybody. I am Brother Luke. Welcome to this fun fellowship Friday night for the Church of the Eternally Secure, CES. Well, happy to see everybody here uh, again for another fun Friday night together. It looks like everybody's really raring to go. I'm sorry that we uh, are starting about 15 minutes behind schedule, uh, but uh, uh, thank you for bearing, bearing with us. Uh, all right, before we get into the discussion and the q and A, I mean the, uh, the true false questions, uh, let's just uh, take a minute to give a, a say hello to everybody. Let's start with uh, the untwisted sister, Sister Renee. Hey there, beloved saints. And I wanted to welcome any uh, new viewers that came over from my channel tonight. If you haven't been here before, welcome. Thanks for coming to hang out with us. And uh, thank you, moderators. Uh, Kevin, thank you so much for saying hello to everyone as they enter. You're a very gracious host. Mm -hmm. uh, really appreciate everything the moderators are doing. And I'm looking forward to hanging out with you guys. Mm -hmm. Amen to all that. Okay, uh, Sister Heather, will you say hello to the congregation? Hi, everyone. Good to be here tonight. I'm Thankfully, thank God I've been able to retrieve my voice. So, because I've, I've been having some problems with my voice tonight, but feeling better. So, ready to answer some questions. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, now, I'm wondering if uh, in the chat room, as, as you're viewing this, does everything look the same? Because uh, uh, Ben told us that uh, Google changed some kind of a format. We had to access this differently than usual and and and, and the screen that we're looking at the, that you cannot see uh it, it's a totally different format than we're used to so we're, we're trying to get used to it but i'm wondering from the chat room of view if anything's different does anybody know all right yes it doesn't look fundamentally different it looks slightly different yeah. but not fundamentally okay not all right all right brother ben while we got you here say hello to everybody Hello, everyone. It's good to be here. Looking forward to the uh, fellowship tonight. Yes, awesome. Okay. Uh, and uh, Sister Lisa, hello. Praise the Lord, beloved of the Most High God, in the mighty name of King Jesus. Glad to be here tonight on Fun Fellowship Friday. Looking forward to it. I'm hoping that Brother Luke will have some wonderful jokes for us this evening. So he can wake everybody up, and make us chuckle. Uh, just Brother Luke, your your jokes are so outstanding. I just want to make sure that before you tell one, you let me know so I don't have anything go up my nose here when I'm sipping something, okay? <laughs> and hello to everyone on the panel, everyone in the chat. Thank you for joining us. Mm, yeah, thank you. Thank you, sister. Oh, well, there are a, a handful of people, I guess, who do appreciate my feeble attempts at humor. Uh, Okay, uh, Brother Steve, will you say hello to everybody? Hello to everybody. Mm -hmm. All right, is that it? Can you think of anything <laughs> else? Do it. <laughs> um, you sound like hello. Diva head there. I, I did? Yeah, you did. Hello oh, to everybody. Bad eighties flashback. My name is Batman. Yeah. Okay. I think we've all said hello. I'm except, uh, we are missing uh, Sister Angel. She hasn't uh, uh, notified us that she won't be here, so I'm, I'm expecting her. So hopefully she'll be able to join us very soon. Uh, okay. Let's get just started with a, a conversation. Um, we're gonna. We have uh, the true false statements ready to go. But be before we get into that, I'd like to talk about a theological subject of interest uh, and get everybody's thoughts, and let's, let's uh, try to figure this out together. Uh, as you know, um, my view on uh, the fate of the lost is that uh, the lost are waiting for the resurrection just as we are. Uh, and when the, when the world is resurrected, the just and the unjust, the, uh, the lost uh, go to the judgment and they're judged lacking the eternal life because they never received eternal life a as a gift because of faith in Jesus. So since they refuse to accept the gift of eternal life, they're, uh, they're 
still mortal and they they are found guilty uh, from refusing the gift so they they end up dying and then they are they go to the lake of fire where they are cremated i don't believe that they're in the lake of fire alive uh, I, I'm, some of the things i say are just because i think that uh, not only do i have to agree with scripture but i i need to agree with the uh, uh, the fundamental character and and nature of god and to me, if God was going to be burning people alive and torturing them for any length of time, it would be uh, cruel. And I don't see that as the God of the Bible. So this is how I see it. And, and so they go into the lake of fire and their bodies cremated and they no longer exist. That so a lot of people call it annihilationism. Uh, you can call it that if you like. I just say that the lost perish because that's what, what the scripture says. Uh, we probably have maybe a third or a half of the congregation that agrees with that to a certain extent. Uh, but then uh, the, the another view, which is, let's call it the traditional view, maybe even it's the majority view, and that is that the lost, uh, they get judged and uh, found they didn't have faith in Jesus, so they get judged uh, for their sins. They Their sins were not paid for, so they, they get cast into the lake of fire and uh, and where that's where they are burned uh, continually or tortured or tormented somehow. There's a lot of disagreements as to uh, exactly how you should describe the torment. Uh, I like to call it torture because that's what it seems, sounds like to me. But uh, um, So uh, it, the concept of eternal torment, the lost people will be tormented indefinitely forever and ever. So these are the two popular views and, uh, and these are the common views we find in the congregation. Uh, 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 there's a guy named uh, Ed Fudge, um, and he's written books on this subject. Uh, he's very interesting, but uh, he, he says that there are three kinds of fire that you can uh, surmise. One is the fire that torments. That would be what eternal torment would, uh, how they would view it. Then there's the fire that consumes. That would be my view, that they're consumed in the fire. And then the third view is that it's the fire that purges. So while the people are in that fire, uh, their sins are being burned off. And uh, after some period of time, uh, they, they paid for their sins uh, and they would uh, be then free and, and be able to go to heaven. And that is generally considered the, the, the concept we find in Roman Catholicism called purgatory. Um, so, uh, we, we want to figure out now, uh, we, we've all agreed that uh, uh, we don't have to agree on eternal torment or annihilation. We've accepted that uh, this is uh, either one of these views, uh, the, the lost, um, they, they, do never, they never get to have eternal life and, and, uh, as, because they never received it. And uh, so there is a consequence. There are people that either perish or are tormented, and it, that's your fate if you didn't believe in Jesus and receive eternal life. Uh, so the idea of purgatory, though, is something we have not ever discussed as far as, is this something that, that we can consider as a third viewpoint that is acceptable? Or... Uh, is it is it something we cannot tolerate because it violates the uh, any of our core doctrines and principles? And uh, I happen to believe it does violate it. And I, I think that it's uh, it negates the reason uh, to, to the need to believe in Jesus because they will uh, be um, after uh, a period of time then they're they're saved even though they had to pay for their own sins. Uh, so, and that, if that's the case, then there's no need for us to preach the gospel. There's no need for them to believe in Jesus. Uh, and so, so it negates the need for the gospel and for receiving salvation, because you can do that after you die. That's why I find it uh, unacceptable. Uh, even, even in my view, it would be repulsive because it, it, it says that you don't have, you don't need Jesus necessarily. Um, so these are the three views, and we, as we said, we've talked about the first two views over the years and agreed that we can disagree on those things. Now tonight we'd like to figure out if the concept of uh, purgatory, I'm going to call this purgatory even though there, let's say that there's various shades of this, various ways that uh, uh, people could um, 
describe what happens to the lost. I'm calling it purgatory, and maybe you won't like the name, but it's just the idea that people can get out of hell. They get out of hell after a period of time. And Rene thinks that after a period of time of tor being tormented in hell, that they perish. Uh, and, and that's acceptable to me. Uh, but do you think that after a period of time of tor being tormented, that they get out of hell and they're free to go? Uh, so that's that's what we're going to be discussing tonight. Uh, let me ask uh, Renee if she wants to give her views on this subject. And let's let's yeah. try to keep each one of our turns just maybe five minutes, and we'll all get a second and a third turn. But I want to get everybody's views on this uh, as quickly as we can. Okay. Well, I would like to say the reason eternal torment is the uh, most popular view is because Augustine pretty much bullied anybody that came to him with the perishing or destruction. And he took that, and if you look at his writing, it's all based on his own philosophy that he got from Aristotle and Plato. He believed that man was immortal, had an immortal soul. But the Bible says that's not true. We only have immortality through Christ. And so without Christ as our source of life, we're not immortal. And so Jude tells us the fate of the lost. I think that's the best place that clears it up. Jesus talked about fearing the one that can destroy both body and soul in hell. There's over 30, I think over 40 verses about how they're destroyed. It's everlasting punishment, not punishing everlasting destruction. And they're consumed by eternal fire. And the fire is eternal because it comes from an eternal source. And so when Jude talks about the fate of the wicked or the lost, He's clear. Sodom and Gomorrah is an exact example of what will happen to the lost. He tells you exactly that. And so what happened with Sodom and Gomorrah? Eternal fire came down from heaven. It's not eternal because it burns forever and ever. It's not quenchable by natural means. So it's eternal fire. We can't put it out. That's what it means. Unquenchable meaning it's not a natural fire. You can't put it out by natural means. It's got an eternal source. And so Jude says, taking vengeance by eternal fire, they were utterly consumed by the fire. And they're basically ashes. They will live no more. It is permanent. Uh, it's better if they'd never been born. There's really no point to their life. They did nothing but sow wickedness. They're going to... There, it says greater damnation. So there's uh, some degrees of it, but they die. They, they, they don't, they aren't given. If you read the early uh, church fathers like Augustine, they knew that immortality, immortality of the soul was a problem. And so some of them would say, well, God's going to give them life so that they can continue to be tortured. I mean, you wouldn't believe some of the stuff the early Roman Catholics wrote. He's going to continue to give them life so they can keep being tormented and tormented. But what we're told is that they're actually risen to condemnation. So they do get risen in bodily form and they are cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. God gives us two choices, eternal life or eternal death. It's death or life. And 40-something verses declare what death is. They're consumed, they're destroyed, they perish. Uh, and there's three verses, all apocalyptic, symbolic language that people should be taking uh, by letting the Bible interpret itself, but they have taken them literally. And that's where this became the prominent teaching in the church. It took me about a year of studying scripture to come to the conclusion that, uh, yeah, the lost will be thrown to the lake of fire. They will suffer, but ultimately they will exist no more. They chose death. They got it. And so when I look at these verses about fire, this is what I see. I go to Revelation and it talks about just, for instance, here. Uh, and death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. Hell there is the grave. I think that Sheol or Hades, which just means the grave itself. So 
uh, death and the grave were cast into the lake of fire. That's why there's a lot of confusion too. People have a view of what hell means in the Bible and it's not always what they think it is in their mind. Hell can just be the grave or shield. Uh, death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. In another place, it talks about how they are cast into the lake of fire where the devil and the false prophet are, right? So um, we there is no restorative fire as in... Uh, the the fire can somehow purge someone of sin and pay for their sin and then eventually they come out no jesus's blood is the only acceptable payment for sin not fire not your suffering but jesus's suffering and although it's nice you know people want to believe this i've heard it comes from universalists Universalists have taken these verses and said, no, this is not a consuming fire. The Bible says God's an all consuming fire, not an all restoring fire, but a consuming fire. It's not a consuming fire. It's a restorative fire. But we see nothing in scripture that supports that. It, it clearly says that there's judgment, that it's better they wouldn't have been born. They suffer the second death. They're destroyed both body and soul in hell or Gehenna, the lake of fire. Um, there, there, there is an end to them. Their end is destruction. They are utterly consumed. In one place, they are ashes. Uh, it's, it's over and over again, all verse after verse after verse about these people being no more. So there's no way they go into a fire and get restored uh through the fire the other fire is the one that's in uh, uh thanks first corinthians uh three maybe anyway it talks about how their works are tried in the fire but not the people themselves and the catholics use that as purgatory but it doesn't say the person is in the fire it says their works are tried and that they're saved though as by fire so meaning uh, they got in by the skin of their teeth because they didn't have any reward. They were saved, though, as by fire, because basically all their works were burned up. Um, but no, there there really is. not I appreciate it's always good to go into scripture testing everything you've learned. It's good. You need to go in there and ask God to show you what his word says, no matter how many people tell you, no matter what they say is orthodox. But the orthodox position is usually the right one because it's been discussed and studied. So it takes me a very long time to come away from something that's considered a doctrinal orthodox position because it's usually been studied very well and has been discussed. But uh, I see it clearly. Uh, the universalists are the ones that came up with this being a restorative fire. It was also believed by some early church fathers. Some did hope for that. It is true. And, and there's nothing wrong with us going in there with an open mind and hearing other views. But what, what I'm saying is I have heard the view. I have researched it thoroughly. And I have researched eternal torment the destruction of the wicked or they call it annihilation, but I, I don't like that because it's like what the Jehovah's witnesses believe. And I don't believe what they believe. Um, uh, and I've, I've studied the restorative possibility of the fire. And my position is that the lost uh, God is a, a, a corporal punishment. He, he believes in execution, not torture. And uh, he doesn't, you notice the, in Israel, they weren't imprisoned, they were executed. And he tells us our choices are life or death. And if you reject Christ, that's it. Uh, without the blood, there is no remission. So uh, the universalists have made this a popular doctrine again. And it's okay for us to investigate these things. It absolutely is. And I would suggest that everyone investigate it themselves, but don't let one person or a couple of clever videos with selective verses get you to believe the position without going back and looking at the things that oppose the position as well. 
when I came to eternal torment versus uh, destruction, it was the Bible itself that convinced me of it. And I looked at the verses that support it. So support eternal torment. So I did not ignore those verses. I took a hard look at both positions for a very long time. So if you are researching something, be very careful to just be persuaded by a cleverly edited video. You want to really do your research, take it to God and look at all the verses that relate to that subject and weigh them out. Um, but that is uh, my position on this is there is no I, I do not see it possible that this fire is restorative. They There's nothing left of these people. It, it, it's there's too many places about them being utterly consumed and suffering the second death and perishing. Um, and Jesus himself said destroyed. So I don't see how it could be uh, restorative. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. I'd like to go to Sister Lisa next. Uh, uh, Sister Lisa, you uh, you hold the traditional viewpoint, and, and you you would tolerate Renee's position or my position, which they're very similar. Uh, but I'm wondering, and uh, let me let me kind of set this, uh, uh, rephrase it, so it may, it's more clear to everybody. Uh, we we know that there are two groups of people. One group of people get eternal life, get to go to heaven. And, uh, and what happens to the other group? Uh, is, uh, they, do they suffer in hell forever or do they go to hell and are destroyed? Or, or is there something else? Uh, is, it, is this other group of people who did not believe in Jesus and get eternal life and go to heaven, uh, is there some other possible way that they could uh, exist uh, rather than uh, being either burned in hell or uh, uh, annihilated? Uh, is that... I'm just trying to restructure this so that we we're focusing on on that that issue, Sister Lisa. Yeah, I do hold to the traditional uh, viewpoint of uh, hell being the holding place for the lake of fire, that the great white throne judgment is the dead being released from hell to be judged. Every man will be judged according to his works. And then anyone whose name is not found written in the lands with the life will be cast into the lake of fire. Um, I have to study the position of, of what you guys are talking about in Revelation chapter 20, 21, I think you said in 22, a little bit further, because I am aware of that scripture uh, that is causing some of the controversy with regard to people who are sitting outside of the city. And you're saying, well, who are these people? I mean, that scripture is there. We can't play like it's, it's not there. And I think it requires some more study. Um, but no, I, I don't think that I could ever conceive that uh, I would ever throw my hat in the ring of universalism because of the things that Jesus spoke about concerning hell, how he admonished against it. Um, and he talks about people uh, departing into everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. So I, <laughs> I have to go and extrapolate those scriptures based on their context and what the other scriptures say regarding damnation and eternal torment um etc et to before i could speak to that matter but i do not believe in uh universalism for the reasons that i just stated uh jesus is god almighty he is god and he cannot lie therefore if he said something is everlasting destruction then it's everlasting destruction if he said it's if it's everlasting fire then it's everlasting fire so uh, I have to go and, and take a further look at it. And I don't believe that I'm uh, ready to speak on it any more than that this evening, um, except that I would like to read uh, uh, one passage that is what I'm uh, uh, talking about, about how it, it, it talks about everlasting here. Um, and that would be in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And it would be verse uh, verse 7 through 10. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe 
because our testimony among you was believed in that day. So, um, you know, there you see a scripture that's talking about everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. So now uh, that will require further study before I could extrapolate as to whether or not they even fit into what they're arguing in chapters 20, 21 and 22. Okay. Uh, so uh, that's all I'm going to say about it. That's the position I hold. And again, I'm going to do some further study if I change my mind, if I repent. I'll come back and let you know I've repented. Okay, Lisa, thank you. I, I want to have a follow-up question for you uh, based on our, our conversation earlier today. Um, you, you asked uh, um, about that particular verse, uh, if, if that was the, the, the verse that uh, we wanted to discuss uh, about them being outside the gate. And I said, yes, but you said, well, you've been... You don't know what to think of that. I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you said something like that. Maybe you can tell me exact words, but something like, well, I don't know what to do with that. I, I haven't figured out what to do. Right. No, I've seen that scripture. I mean, if, if you've studied uh, Revelation, if you looked at it, when you get down to the end there, you see the scripture where there are people who are sitting outside the gate that mm -hmm. are evidently guilty of certain uh, things, and they're not permitted inside of the city. It describes them as being... Uh, having certain characteristics concerning um, whatever sins they were involved with evidently in this life. Now, what I know people want to get all upset when you say dispensation, but the Bible speaks about different dispensations. So uh, I'm not hyper dispensationalist. I just know that there are different times the Lord is doing different things and he's the one that set the times. OK, there's a time for all things. He's the one that set the times. Now, if. Uh, at this point, there's something that happened in between how they got where they are and these other judgments. That's possible. I have to study that book a little bit harder. Um, my focus has been on other things since I know I'm secure in Christ and I'm trying to work out my salvation with fear and trembling and assist others this side of what we're going through. That's what my focus has been. Not like after the millennial kingdom and something else. So that's that's what I'm saying. I have to go look at that a little bit more. I have not studied the book of the Revelation. Uh, I've read it several times, but I've not studied it to the degree to be able to give you further explanation about that scripture. And that's going to have to take an examination of other scriptures. I would never be ready to go make a doctrine out of one scripture. And I think people should be careful to make sure that they don't do that. That would be the one thing I would caution. Well, you run off and say, this is the doctrine and this is how it is. Okay, where do you find that in other parts of the Bible, if this is indeed true, that it's gonna be universal salvation? Okay, then fine. And how do we put that up against other scriptures that say, no, it's not. Now, what do we do with those? We just throw those out of the Bible? So uh, that's what I'm saying. We, we do have to be prayerful and careful. And and don't just take one scripture and then go make a doctrine out of it. Yeah. Uh, so every time I've ever seen anybody end up in heresy and error, that's exactly what they did. Yeah. All right. Thank you. The um, the reason I asked you that follow up question is you. I'm sure you remember that when you told me, uh, I don't know what to do with that verse. I can't figure that out. I don't know. Uh, I said, then do you think because uh, that verse is so unclear? Not only does Lisa not know, I don't know. I don't know if anybody here would claim to know and really give us a real certain explanation of these people outside the gate. If this is the case that none of us seem to know, uh, I would caution everybody that we don't form doctrines on uh, verses that are uh, ambiguous and everybody's trying to figure it out. Nobody, we form our doctrines based on one, verses that are clear, and easy to understand and not ambiguous verses. We also, we also form our doctrines if if a clear verse, the point is being made over and over again. And in this case, we have this one reference to these people outside this gate, and we have to be very careful to not form take any doctrinal positions on those if you if you because it is ambiguous uh, uh, and uh, uh, and certainly there's nothing else in the Bible that, that will. Uh, clarify it for us or or make it clear and you know so it's it's no question we know what it means uh, i want to give brother ben the next turn go ahead brother
You're muted, man. Getting used to the new setup. Um, so a couple things. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not. Uh, I don't. I'm not. I wouldn't say I'm dogmatic about uh those those room those people on the outside of the gates, but I I, I believe I have um. I believe I, I have I think scripture gives us a, a pretty good clues. Um and I, I feel like I understand who those people are, but not, I wouldn't insist that anyone says believes as I do. Um but uh again at, um you know so I, I you know this whole idea of, of annihilation versus ter eternal torment versus purgatory, you know, I know there there are many things in scripture that make make uh make us uncomfortable. Um and and I think it's you know anything we time anytime there's something uncomfortable the tendency of us is wanted is to want to smooth it over um, and I I think that we need to be careful against that because we I we don't want that to led to interpret influence our interpretation um, we want to we want to be you know we want to exegete not eisegete and so uh, in that sense I think it's important not to lean on our own understanding uh, especially on on things that are speculative. Um, but rather we should learn on, lean on God's under the God, what God's understanding is and his God's understanding is revealed in his word. So I think it's always important to back yeah. up anything that we say, uh, or, or are dogmatic on with scripture alone. Um, and so, you know, we should only allow scripture to say what, what it actually says and, to, and allow that alone to inform our teaching and doctrine, not based on areas that where it is silent, for example, um, so I know a lot of this revel the, the this doctrine of you know eternal torment versus annihilation etc. A lot of it comes from revelation, not all of it, but a lot of a lot of it. And um, revelation really is I think is is a is the consummation of the Old and New Testaments, and it draws together truths that were previously revealed uh, in each testament. So um, you know revelation was also written by John, and so I I believe to interpret it correctly, you you need to uh, factor in. The themes, the phrases, the terms that John used previously and disclosed in his gospel and, and his epistle. So, for example, the uh, the uh, Revelation talks about overcomer, and it doesn't define what an over overcomer is whatsoever. It assumes that you have already gained that knowledge uh, by reading John's epistles and the gospel of John. So, Jesus, for example, said, uh, "Be of good cheer, because I have overcome the world." And in, in that's the theme in John's gospel, and it's also a theme in his, his epistles that says, "Whoever believes in that Jesus is the Son of God has overcome the world." And what has overcome the world? Our faith. So it's our faith that makes us overcomer. So I think it's very important to be systematic about this kind of thing and not take Revelation as it or, or any chapter as it as it as if it occurs in a vacuum. It, it 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 it's based on uh, uh, doctrines that were previously revealed, so uh, I think that's important. Um, another another uh, theme I think that where this comes into play, where people refer to the Book of Life, and there's all kinds of theories about what the Book of Life is, but I think again, taking it systematically, I think we can come to a pretty reasonable conclusion about what it is. So, for example, the first time we hear, read about the Book of Life or or, or a book of any type is is in Genesis 2, uh, where Genesis 2 says, This is the history of the heavens and the earth where they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. So the word history there is the word Toledoth. And Toledoth, uh, people have debated about it, what exactly what that means, but generally it's accepted that it means like a book or generations. Um, or almost, it, it, I kind of think of it as a, a, a almost like a family tree almost. Uh, if that's a common theme where it's the generation of just like Adam was the generation or the Toledoth of of a uh, fallen man, Jesus is the Toledoth or the generation of the new man, and that theme is, again is emphasized even in Genesis 11 where it says this is the genealogy of Shem. He, Shem was 100 years old and begot and begot. So it it's the Toledoth of Shem or genealogy or generation of Shem or the book of Shem is who he was and all that he begat or all, all that he created essentially. Um, and so I think, again, I think that's all these kind of things are important to our form of what was going on here. And also too, is that, you know, in revelation, it talks about the book. It, uh, so the first reference in uh, revelation about the book of life is in revelation three, five, it says he who overcomes, which we were, I believe, uh, again, the Bible establishes is someone who believes it says he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments and 
I will never blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and his angels. And that's written to a church. And so we know that the book of life there is obviously, I believe, the the, the Lamb's book of life. Because the, ch the church, I don't think anyone would disagree, is in the Lamb's book of life. But later, the, and so, so that the first mention of book of life in Revelation, again, being very systematic about this, I think that's how we need to approach these kind of things. Um, the first instance of book of life in Revelation that talks, is, is, is about believers and being in Christ. And, and, and the second instance clarifies with the book of, that the book of life is actually the book of the life of the Lamb. And so in Revelation 13, 7, this is the second instance where book of life occurs. It says, it was granted to him to make war with the saints, to overcome them, and authority was given over uh, every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. So right there we see book of life associated with the Lamb and from the foundation of the world. Yet in this third instance of Revelation, uh, it's in 17, it says, the beast who you saw was not and is not, so this is Revelation 17, 8, the, the beast that, that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit, um, will go into perdition, and those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. So right there you see the book of life, but this time it doesn't mention the lamb, but this time it does mention the foundation of the world. So again, systematically, if you build these things together, you can you can draw a, a string that says, okay, the book of life is to, about believers. Then the second time it says the, uh, about the book of life of the lamb from the foundation of the world. And then the third instance, it doesn't mention the book of life of the lamb, but it does mention the book of life from the foundation of the world. So again, that's just a general principle that I use. And I think scripture repeatedly emphasizes, and I, I, I could go on about this and I, wanna, I don't want to take too much time, but that's the kind of the general principle I use. And um, for that reason, um, I think a lot of these doctrines come from uh, people taking verses in isolation, um, and I think it's very important to allow to uh, for us to build our doctrine systematically. Because every one time I see a, a false doctrine, it's always because people have not allowed the full weight of what was said before to bear on what is said um, in relation to to a certain verse, for example. So um, that's that, that that's one of the foundational principles that I would I, I would ask us to keep uh, you know keep it at the forefront. Okay, Ben, thanks. I want to go to Steve next, but uh, let me um, go a little further with trying to uh, isolate on something. This this one verse about the people outside the gates, uh, what are we going to do with that? Um, what I'm concerned is, um, um, we, you know that uh, we, we or me particularly, and us as a congregation, we made a mistake in the past by... Um, uh, allowing uh, certain teachings that we eventually realized that were unacceptable, but we allowed it. And, and uh, now we've, we've um, um, kind of, what's the word, uh, cleansed ourselves from that. So we're, everything's good now. But I learned a lesson. And uh, the, the verse in Corinthians when it says, not another gospel, not another uh, Jesus, and, and, but you did it. You, you put up with it. Uh, so Paul is chastising the Corinthian church, saying, you let them come into your church and teach a different Jesus, a different gospel, and so on, and you put up with it. So he's he's shaming them. How, you should be ashamed of yourself. And that's how I feel about uh, my part in the, in, the, in the last controversy we had. So uh, now that makes me uh, uh, diligent and uh, uh, hypersensitive and, and determined to not make those kinds of mistakes again. Uh, so the question I have is, uh, on this one verse here, I already told you that uh, taking a verse from Revelation, which is an apocalyptic style of writing, which is purposely meant to be not easily understood and mysterious, but to take this one verse and, and uh, form a, a uh, extrapolate something uh, after that uh, is, is a mistake. And so what are we going to do with, what will we do with these people outside the gate? Um, is it, um, we, we can, can we allow these people to uh, the position that these people never believed in Jesus and they don't have to go to hell, but they still get to live forever, even though they didn't believe in Jesus. Is this something that we can say, 
Oh, bygones. Uh, we're uh, it's uh, don't worry about it. It's just another viewpoint that is uh, we you know like we disagree on so many things. Uh, is that something that we can give this kind of liberty, or does it cross a line and violate something that that we need to uh, be diligent to to protect? And that is that uh, no one will have eternal life or go to heaven and have eternal life without having their faith in Jesus before they die. Uh, that's uh, that's the doctrine that Christianity is based upon, and that's what I'm guarding, and, and uh, I'm going to I'm going to continue to guard that so I don't make that those mistakes again. So, brother Steve, uh, maybe you could talk about that particular verse and, and keep what I said in mind. I'm wondering if on that verse, if we if we um, are not careful, we're going to come up with a group of people who didn't have to believe in Jesus, and yet they have eternal life, and they didn't have to go to hell. Uh, well, uh, and Steve, uh, we'll keep it to five minutes too. I'm trying to make sure I get through everybody. I know you have, yeah, you I, have uh, lots to say, but everybody's going to get a second and a third uh, turn. So don't worry. Well, uh, I, I honestly, I don't know where to begin because um, I feel like from just watching the chat, it, it, you know, we. You know, I I don't I honestly don't know what to say on this right now because uh, there's a lot of things that I feel about this discussion that um, I I agree with. You know, the the major points that have been said tonight: analyze scripture with scripture, test the spirits, Just make sure that what we are are hearing or listening to or any doctrine uh, in scripture is that, that it lines up with the rest of scripture, especially the gospel. Um, and, and like Lisa said, I haven't studied Re revelation in depth. No. Um, but you know, that, that, that verse, those verses in the, in the, last couple chapters of revelation i have wondered about for a very long time and i grew up being taught eternal torment and then annihilationism comes along and i give that a fair shake and then there's there's an, an outside outside of those two theories i've heard many other types of theories um and i heard a different theory recently and I've been listening to it for the past two to three weeks. And, and so, uh, I've been entertaining it. Like, like you had described us to do Luke with when you entertained annihilationism originally when, you know, so that's where I'm at. I, I haven't made a conclusion either way. I used to believe, I used to just believe it was simply eternal torment. Then annihilationism comes along, and that seems to jive more with Scripture, but there were still unanswered questions. And some of these are, are specifically unanswered questions. What I can say for an absolute fact that I am sure of, because I spent most of my time on three things. Who saves? Who does the saving? How are we saved? Um, that, uh, that, uh, uh, what, what is, what, what is the walk of the believer and the warfare of the believer? And that because of these things that about the, the, the state of the lost at the end, there's a lot of theories that have come up in the last three years that I, that I, I, and there's things that I, I have never gotten answers to. And those verses are some of those things. And, and I've heard a person, uh, that, that didn't come up with a theory, but studied, studied it out over months and months with other people together, studying it. And, um, I don't believe in universalism. I don't believe in purgatory. 
I don't believe those things, but I do believe there is punishment for the lost, that scripture is clear, that whatever that punishment will be, it's, it, it's eternal, and that God is just. God will be just, and he will have mercy and grace on whom he will have mercy and grace. And those of us that believe in Jesus do not have to worry about whatever that punishment will be. It's bad. And it's at the very least eternal separation from God. I believe hell is involved. The second death is is involved with, with, with a lot of this. And I don't pretend to be an eschatological scholar. I don't pretend to be a scholar of any kind. But I will stand on the gospel that saves us through Jesus from whatever that end shall be. And I'm a, I... I I'm pretty much where Lisa's at, that I've spent the majority of my time not in Revelation, not in Daniel, not mm -hmm. in Ezekiel. I've read them. Brother, but, I, I, I have to interrupt you because, uh, I mean, okay. I, I want to make sure everybody gets a turn and keep it moving. But I, I, I asked you if you could, uh, rather than broadly on the, the whole subject of, of what is the state of the lost, uh, on that one particular group of people, that one verse, what do we do with, with that? Is it is it a problem? Is it something we cannot accept uh, that uh, there is a group of people who did not have to believe in Jesus before they died, and yet they get to live forever and, and they didn't have to go to hell? I, 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 I never said. I, I want you to just zero in on that if you want, wouldn't mind. I, I, and see, that's the thing. I haven't studied it out myself, okay. and I'm not saying they didn't go to hell. I'm not, I don't know who those people are. And I also think that, that for that to be believers, to be stuck outside of the gate, never able to enter into the presence of God, that goes against everything I know about the, the glorious hope for the believer. So who are they? And so I can't, I can't, I don't know how to answer that, that question. Mm -hmm. Well, that's why the reason, that. you, the reason you're, str you're struggling to answer it is just as Lisa earlier when we were talking, uh, she was struggling to answer it. And that's my point. If we are struggling to answer this, if it's not clear, let's really, really be careful and not come to any conclusions on something that's so ambiguous. And let me, let me ask Sister a uh, Angel to go, to go next. Sorry, Angel. Sorry you had to wait so hey. long. I need to give her oh, a it's okay. Uh, um, so when it comes to, you know, I, uh, I didn't feel like anybody was reaching conclusions about any of this. I thought somebody was, you know, proposing a theory that they had well, Angel, not, and Angel, even Angel, somewhat Angel, reluctantly. Angel, Angel please, uh, okay. because you were late, you, you were not here. We, we privately discussed before we started that we would talk about this as a theological question, not okay. a to last night's conversation or any individuals. That's what we've been trying okay. to do. So if you could just focus only on the subject and forget right. about anything that happened last night. Okay. Well, if you would. okay. Yes. It's just hard because we're talking about uh, reaching conclusions and I'm, I don't know where that came from, but I, I agree. Yeah. Don't reach any conclusions about something that's confusing. I know that for me, it really terrifies me more to think that those are believers than any possible other explanation that, that strikes fear in my heart. So, I can understand why anybody would would uh, have a hard time not theorizing about it, um, but I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't have any. Do like I, I don't. Uh, I have not seen a convincing argument that has that's totally airtight for literally anything regarding um, the eternal state of the lost. Like there's there's there's. I, I mostly lean toward uh, I guess annihilationism. Um, but there are still, like we're talking about with this question of people outside the gate or other little things where I, everybody is missing, like everybody that I've ever heard. There's something missing uh, with all of uh, all, all formerly proposed doctrine uh, or explanations for all of this that I don't know what it is. And I feel like it's probably by, I mean, it for, you know, I don't, maybe God doesn't want us to know. Maybe God doesn't want us to know because I have never heard anybody be able to draw it all together no loose ends completely wrapped up in a nice bow it's it's very uh confusing. so i just don't uh, get super invested in it things i get i don't i definitely don't like the idea of actual universalism but um but when it comes to that i i see what you're saying yeah don't um 
we should make conclusions on unclear verses. I totally, I totally agree with that. I don't think uh, I haven't, I don't feel like anybody's making conclusions here tonight. So, um, uh, and I, I do agree that, that that would be unwise to do just in general as a general uh, practice. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, all right. Well, we can go on to our normal program if you like, unless someone has more to say about this. But as I said, uh, I, I do. My, my, uh, I'll let you go next, Renee. But my, my concern. I didn't sleep last night. I, I, and I, I really, I don't know. I, I'm okay right now, but mine hasn't been working. By the way, I'm going to ask everybody if you wouldn't mind. I'm going to, ask everybody to pray for me because now I've got some symptoms and my wife is afraid that I have uh, COVID. So if I don't change to get better tomorrow, she wants me to go get a test. So she's quite worried. <clears throat> and so uh, I don't think I do, but I do have some symptoms that uh, are uh, affecting me. So please pray for that. Uh, but my point is um, I'm, um, Forgot where I was. I was going, but the um, never mind. Uh, okay, uh, Renee, why don't you go next? Okay, one, my mouse is gonna die. I didn't even know this mouse had to be charged. That's how technically advantaged I am. So if I can't answer you guys, it's because I have no mouse. But the second thing, okay, this verse, I finally found it. What you guys are talking about. Uh, this is just a, it's an artistic way of referencing Genesis about the tree of life, you know, uh, and it's, it's just talk, it's dividing those that have access to the tree of life versus those that are lost. It says, um, he that is unjust let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that's holy, let him be holy still. And it goes on, uh, behold, it come quickly. My reward is with me to give to every man according to his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever maketh a lie. It's just a way, uh, an artistic way of separating the lost from the saved. And it's saying it, it's not a, this particular part is not a, I don't think it's referencing the actual gate. Like there's unsaved people outside the gate and they can't get in. It, it's actually a, an artistic way of saying, that only the the righteous of God are going to be in this place, enter into the garden, into uh, the place of rest where the tree of life is. And if you're not in there, it's because you're one of the lost. It's just an artistic way of saying that. But if you want to take it literal, like there's gates and there's a city and you can't get in, well, if you want to take that literally, there are people that survive this time. And I know you you don't agree with this view, but that people that survive it, this time of great tribulation that are mortal, they're not glorified. They're not killed during this time, but they survive it. And, and you see later that they have children and they have very long lifespans. And at the end, thousand years satan comes and deceives these people their descendants he comes and deceives the nations a thousand years later so there will be people in the, in this thousand year reign with the new jerusalem that'll have mortals that are not in their glorified bodies i would think they would not be able to enter into the holy city so if they're mortal and they're still in their mortal sinful flesh, they probably couldn't enter, literally, if you want to look at it that way. That's who those people could be. But I think this part in Revelation here is just saying, whosoever's righteous, let him be righteous, and whosoever's filthy, let him be filthy, because the time is at hand. The end is here. The time has run out. So you can either enter in with Jesus or you're outside the gate. The door is shut. 
time is up. Judgment is here. I think it's just an artistic way of saying that. I really do. And and I would worry that we, you know, we, that's one of the things you were saying. We don't want to build doctrine on revelation or apocalyptic, symbolic, artistic language or parables. Uh, and I also want to uh, let Kev know, he seems very upset. This is not about what you said, your theory, anything at all. This was just the discussion we thought might be interesting to have. Let us all have ideas on what this might mean. We're not even discussing what your theory was. I don't even know what your theory was. I was gone before that happened. We're discussing this section of scripture because it was very interesting. I promise you, Kevin, this is not about you in any way. Or are we even discussing what you said? I don't know what you said. But I want you to know that because I've said it several times in the chat. And I promise you that's not what this is about. There's nothing wrong with having theories and researching. I don't even know what your theory was. We're just talking about it in general. But uh, I really do think that's all this is. I think it's just an artistic way of saying, hey, the door's going to shut. Judgment is here. It's over. I'm, I'm coming. Mm -hmm. All right. Anybody else want to say more? Um, I, I, I had a couple of things. Um, I think, yeah, I totally agree with Renee. It, it, it's kind of an artistic way of saying, like, you know, again, right in, for, in early in Genesis, he says, uh, we are learning, you know, about the separation of light and darkness. And in Revelation, we, we learn about the the light of the new temple and everyone outside of it is in darkness. So, like, just like Jesus said, um, the sons of the kingdom, were, which we referring to the, the unbelieving uh, Jews of his generation, will be thrust out into outer, outer darkness. I believe outer darkness is a reference to hell. I'm, I'm, I'm personally convinced of that, but I'm not expecting anyone to believe that. But... Again, I think if we're consistent and let a lot of scripture to, you know, carries these themes forward and inform our doctrine or form our interpretation, it, it can be very helpful. So, like Renee said, the people who are um, the whoremongers outside, the whoremongers, the dogs, all everyone who practices a lie, that, that's an artistic way of saying those people are in outer darkness, whereas the temple is in light, where God himself is the light of that temple. And even in Revelation 21... Uh, through 23, it says the city had no need of sun or moon to shine in it for the glory of God illuminated it. The lamb is its light and the nations of those who are saved shall walk in this light and the kings of the earth shall bring glory and honor into it. Sorry, it says the kings of the earth shall bring their glory and honor into it. And some people would, would interpret that as, okay, that's a repeated thing. They're, uh, the, the, you know, believers are kings of the earth and they're repeatedly... Uh, uh, taking the gl the glory and the honor of the uh, unsaved um, or the the those that weren't in Christ into the into the temple, and I don't, I don't believe that's what it's saying at all. In fact, I don't, I don't think anyone who's not saved has any glory or honor at all. And if you study the, the the theme of glory and honor all throughout Revelation, it's all about God deserving the glory and honor. Even right before the uh, the warning of the um, of, of of taking up the mark of the beast, it says. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every tribe, nation, and tongue, saying with a loud voice, voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him. And so you see all through, uh, If you again, I would rec uh, recommend, if you guys are interested, to study out the glory and honor in Revelation. It's all about uh, the worship that God uh, receives is worthy of and and the right after that verse it that's talked about that then says no the, the unbelievers of the world they will actually will not worship god per the angels instructions they're actually going to worship the beast and so um i th i believe the worship that the saints the kings of the earth bring into the temple is it really just a one-time act it's not like a recurring thing it's just again this is the consummation of all things they're, they're bringing in those who are redeemed they're bringing in their honor and glory and their honor and glory is the worship of god into that temple um because it says rather that even that no no by no means to shut anything uh defiled be able to enter into that temple that defiles it well anything that's offered up by an unbeliever or uh, someone who's not in Christ, uh, that would I would consider that something that would defile it. So um, I think it, again, I think it's important to consider all these things and uh, and not take any certain verse in, in, as it occurs in a vacuum. Okay, uh, Steve, I knew I cut it cut you off, so I'm going to give you a chance if you want to say anything more before we go into the uh, true false. 
Okay. Um, and I, I want to make it clear that when we say no verse should be taken um, or any of these statements that we're making, that these aren't accusations against someone or anyone in particular or anything when it, when it comes to the study of which what this would be would be eschatology the 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 end of the lost what happens at the end the the, the end of all things that's uh, you know the that and the these verses that are unclear yes we don't take them in a vacuum we look at them and i and i think um to to be honest i'm feeling like although we 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 agreed that that this wouldn't be about something that happened recently but i feel like if that thing that happened recently if that hadn't happened we wouldn't be having this conversation right now so i feel like you know i, I you know i i, I uh, I don't, I'm trying to, to keep within your parameters of what you asked us. I really am. So, uh, but there's, there's so many different theories about that. And all I know that I can say with absolute certainty is that there, that what the Bible says, there is, there is a definite eternal consequence for the lost and to be saved from that. You need Jesus at the end of the day. And um, I, I would rather have this conversation personally if we're going to talk about a theory that's introduced of, by anyone, no matter who it is, uh, that, 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 you know, whoever is introducing a theory about eschatology should be included in the conversation. Um, and, and, and that's just my opinion um, so that we can look at all the context of the verses and stuff. Um, you know, is it artistic language in revelation? Some believe it is. Some believe it isn't. There's scholars that say it is. There's scholars that say it isn't. Um, there's, there's scholars that say it's annihilation. There's scholars that say it's, it's eternal torment. There's scholars that say, Oh no, you know, purgatory. I don't believe in purgatory for sure. I don't think you, there's no earning of salvation. There's no earning, uh, uh, uh anything like that. So, but these verses, you know, uh, I, I see the, the parallel to Genesis, but I also see the verse that says the spirit and the bride say come to these people. Now, is, is that just a reference to the, the, the Holy Spirit and the bride of Christ that's already saved, preaching the gospel and the work of the Holy Spirit? Perhaps. But if it's looked at literally... Uh, and not as figurative language, then, and this is, the whole revelation is about, is, is about the apocalypse, about the end times. Yes, some of it is about what, uh, especially the, the seven letters was written to actual churches, but it's also about the end times. So uh, some of it, I think, is literal. Some of it, I think, is, uh, you know, poetic language. But, you know, a lot of those analyses have been done by men. And at the end of the day, we need to listen to God. We need to ask the Holy Spirit for discernment on these things and that it should be okay to present a theory that as long as it does line up and the theory should be heard and or discussed or questions should be able to be asked about these things um, and and looked at and not responded to with dogmatism when it's something that's outside of the gospel, um, which I, you know, I can see bearing on it with the gospel, but I don't think it's directly tied to the gospel. Um, because there, you know, if we go that route, then we would have to separate between annihilationist and eternal security or ter eternal torment people, because the eternal torment people feel like annihilationism uh, takes away from the gospel and, and the salvation there thereof. So, uh, and, and vice versa, uh, that there's, there's, 
there's interpretation, there's feelings in it with, you know, would God torment people? At the end of the day, I trust that God will be just and that to avoid any of these theories that are possibilities, because, you know, about what is eternal death? What is eternal punishment? What is eternal shame and contempt? What are, what is that exactly? Well, it's at least what those words say. It's, it's those things. And you only get eternal life through Christ. Um, how God fleshes all that out. We'll see. But if you want to avoid all that, the, 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 the punishment for not believing in Christ which is which really, you know, the punishment for your sin because and failure to believe in Christ really is, is you choosing that punishment, in my opinion, whatever it shall be. But to believe in Christ is to escape any of these theories. And that's where I'll stand. It's bad. Don't go. Don't risk it. Believe in Jesus. Okay, Ben, you ready for the true false? Yes, yes, I am. Uh, let me pull the first one up. Um, but I, 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 one thing I would like to say is that I don't, I don't think we should be a, a afraid to talk about things, and, and you know, and, and some people getting upset just about just because we're discussing something. I, I don't understand that. Um, but yes, here's the first true, first true true false question: is um, true or false? Job was a real, not a real person, but served as a character lesson for righteousness. Okay. Uh, who submitted the question? That was Heather, I believe. Okay, Heather, that means you get to go last. Uh, how about have uh, Sister Lisa go first? Can you do that? Nope, Brother Luke, I'm going to mess you up. I need another second here. Okay, I Sister Lisa. I, I don't know, guys. I'm sorry. My mouse is about to die. I have no charger for it. I didn't know that the mouse needed charging. It's an iMac, and so it needs to be purchased. I am so sorry. I have no way of navigating my computer if it dies. Okay. All right, sister. Thank you for being coming. Will y'all please forgive me? I, I did not know this. I am so sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you guys. Mm -hmm. I, I to once, you, once you leave, we're going to discuss some kind of a reprimand for you. Um, yeah, I think we should talk about Sister Renee behind her back and <laughs> accuse her of actually setting this up so she could bail on the conversation and not have to answer any of the questions. Yeah. <laughs> if I Good can night, Sister Renee. PC, I will. If I can <laughs> my old PC, I will. Okay. 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 All Love right. You. All right, nice. Thank Good you. Night, sister. Thank you. All right, Sister Angel, will you go next? Okay, so the question was what, whether Job was a real person or not? Yes. Okay, and so it was phrased that Job was not a real person, but rather, okay. So then I would say false, because I do think Job was a real person. Um, I think, uh, I don't know. I, I mean, I, 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 mean I, I could see why somebody would say that. I, was, I could see why somebody would say that. I've never heard that proposed before. But honestly, having never thought about this question before, I would just have to say, though, the way that I see that God does this, and I believe um, the way that uh, uh, just the way that the scripture is uh, written, uh, typically, I don't think it was a parable. I don't think it was supposed to be seen as a parable. Um, so I would say false. Uh, and I'm curious to see what other people say. But uh, yeah, right now, I just say false. They need okay. false. All right. Yeah, thank you. Uh, all right, uh, Sister Heather, what you what do you say? No, that was her question. So oh yeah, know. she's last. I'm sorry. Okay, um, uh, Brother Steve. What was the question again? I'm sorry, I don't What's have you? anywhere to see it. What? Was Job a real person, or is he just a fictional story to teach a lesson? He was a real person. Okay. And he was written, uh, what, he, what, he, uh, what was written of him was written down to teach a lesson. Yes, it was several lessons, actually. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Brother Ben? 
I believe it was, I believe it was a, it's, yeah, no, it's, it, he was a real person. There's a lot of, uh, historical, um, facts in that, in that book, uh, dates, places, they're not dates, but names, uh, places, real places, real names, um, I think real situations, um, and to, to suggest it's not, um, a real person, I think takes a lot away from its, um, its value, um, uh, I think again, the, Job is not something I, I. One of the books I've studied as as much as I have the other other books in the Bible, but I know it's profound in in a lot of the things that that it just generally teaches about the plight of of our our plight. You know, man's perspective and God's perspective on uh, the circumstances that we find ourselves in. Um, I think it, it's really profound in helping to us us to understand, uh, you know, where we're at and how God sees it and how we how how man sees it, um, and, uh, for, for that reason, I think it, it would, it would be a serious, um, not, not, I think it, it would be, it would take a lot of value from the, from the book if we were to suggest that it was just, um, not real, and it's also a, a very slippery slope, I think, because what else are, are we getting willing to say, well, didn't, what else in the Bible didn't really happen, or not, is not actual his, history, uh, I know a lot of, uh, denominations will teach, they you know, to support the theory of, uh, molecules demand evolution they'll, they'll they teach a lot of gen genesis is uh is um allegory metaphor etc not real history and where i believe it absolutely it absolutely is history um so i think that's i think it's a slippery slope and and uh i'm not not one that i'm willing to uh to go down so i i absolutely believe it's real um a real book and uh i in fact i like it one of the reasons i, I one of the profound Truth in it, I believe, is that it's one of the few books of the Bible that talks about dinosaurs or dragons, um, and um, you know, for me, that's a profound evidence of the truthfulness tr truthfulness of the Bible. I would think it'd be, um, you know, uh, not not troubling, but um, peculiar if the Bible didn't uh, talk about dragons and dinosaurs. Um, but we find them. We find, I think we find very real accounts of them in the Book of Job. Um, so uh, yeah, I think it's a great. I think it's. I think it's probably the first book written personally. First book written, huh? I'm not. I'm not sure. I think I've heard that speculation before. Um, the uh, I, I, again, a, a rule. I mean, certain to me, I, I try to apply certain rules uh, as I make my conclusions from Bible study. And just as I would say that uh, um, if we have what the church would call orthodoxy, the, the traditional accepted positions on various questions, um, that it's been this, this position for a long time, as Brother Ben said, the result of, or Rene said I this, I think, that it's the result of many theologians over many centuries discussing and debating and, and then and uh, coming to a conclusion. I would say that uh, before we move out of orthodoxy, uh, before we move away from the, any majority traditional viewpoint, we should be very slow and, and, and uh, cautious. Uh, now you might say, well, that sounds funny coming from you. You've changed your position on some things. And, yeah, but when I've changed my position, it was the result of at least a year of, of, of uh, study with someone who's opposing me, and I'm here. There, there. Steve, could you mute? Thanks, Steve. Uh, it's, so it's the result of a lot, of, a lot of private study with an individual that opposes me, and I'm hearing them out, and we're debating it privately. And after maybe a year, uh, uh, grudgingly, I moved away from a traditional position. What I did that with. Uh, uh, on uh, the eternal torment question. I did that on the flat earth question. I've done that on a few things, and uh, but I'm going to resist not being in the majority uh, unless the scriptures are clear and I have no way around it. I don't want to be some a part of a, a little group of people that hold some strange doctrine that is, uh, you know, that is really peculiar. Uh, we, we should really be careful about that. And the same thing would apply to this question here. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to believe the Bible is true. It's a real person. It's a real story. I'm going to take it literally, unless it says that uh, God has feathers. We, you know, there's all, sometimes it's obvious that there's uh, 
allegory. Uh, but uh, if it's not clearly allegory, then we need to take it uh, literally that this is a real person. Um, there are some parables that uh, we could say that, uh, well, that's not a real person. It's a, it's a lesson. But the whole book of Job, um, the parables are always little short accounts. Uh, this is a quite a lengthy book with a lot of information about this man's life. Uh, so I, I see no reason to um, uh, think of it any other way than, than he was a real person. All right, let me see. Uh, who hasn't? Okay, got... Brother Luke, I can jump in now. Yeah, uh, go ahead, sister. <laughs> okay, I was. I said certainly true, and then one of the reasons that I would give for that he's a real person is uh, one the length of which the story is. I don't think the Bible would have let all of that, you know, be told and not say it was a parable. But also James chapter five verse eleven uh, mentions Job. And that, uh, you know, whenever I see it quoted in other passages, then I go, this is real. This is something we should pay attention to because other passages of the Bible speak about it. So uh, when he said, behold, we count them happy, which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. So. I, I think that uh, he certainly was a real person. The Bible talks about his his children having been killed. And then when he restores um, his uh, new set of children to him, that he counts. This is one thing I loved about that story on the story of Job. He counts the children who had been killed among the living. He numbers them with the living. And if you remember when Jesus uh, walked the earth, he spoke and he said, God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. And the other thing that I loved about that passage with Job was that for the first time in the Bible, you see where Job gave his daughters the same inheritance that he gave his sons. And this, I believe, was a foreshadowing of Christ giving women <laughs> restoring us to right relationship from the fall coming in Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek bond nor free male nor female in Christ. We're restored to right relationship. And this is a foreshadowing of that uh, when he gives them the same inheritance. So uh, I, I think he's definitely a, a, a real person. And even though he's not mentioned in the lineage of Christ, and that's because he was from a, a different a group of people, uh, he was still a believer. So uh, that that would be my answer. I'll keep it short and sweet. I don't want to go too far down the road. Did I get disconnected? No, no, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. it, it hurt, it's hard for me to maneuver through the new system. Yeah, I, I understand. I, I'm mute. Uh, thank you. Uh, now, I noticed you said certainly true, and several people in the chat room said certainly true, but uh, there are no votes in the uh, on the record there. They're true. All the votes are for certainly false, and uh, I think your position actually, Lisa, is certainly false because – I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, it, you guys flipped not, – Not a real person. I flipped it the other way around. I did answer certainly false that Joe – where – yeah, because the way it's worded, I get twisted around, but I didn't answer it correct. Yes, certainly false. Yeah. Or I was saying he, it's true that he's a real person, but it's certainly false the way the question is worded. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, all right. I think Sister Heather, has everybody answered besides Heather? Um, did I miss anybody? All right, Heather, enlighten us. All right. I'm plugging my phone in because it's about to die. Um, I actually. What um I love the book of Job and I have always loved it and I've heard people talk about that it he might not have been a real person and it kind of bothered me but I was doing a study um a few months ago and I found this verse I'm going to start with Ezekiel 14 verse 12 it says the word of the Lord came again to me saying so this is the word of the lord this is god speaking through ezekiel say uh, saying son of man 
when a land sins against me by persisting unfaithfulness, I will stretch out my hand against it. I will cut off its supply of bread, send famine on it, and cut off every man and beast from it. Verse 14 says, Even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, I would deliver only, uh, I'm sorry, they would deliver only themselves by their righteousness, says the Lord God. So if he is real enough for God, he's real enough for me. And that is my answer. All right. Thank you. Uh, all right. Anybody want to say uh, any more about that? Yeah, question? I do. Brother Luke, what passage was that? Well, I don't really want to say more. I missed it because I was in the chat. What passage was that she just read? Ezekiel 14. And I read 12 through 14. Thank 14, you, Heather. Verse 14 is the one that talks about Job. Ezekiel 12, verse 14. Yeah, I read the other two for context. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Is that it, Lisa? Or did you want to add any more? No, I just wanted to be able to go read that because I was uh, chatting and I didn't want to miss All it. Right. Thank you. Did uh, everybody have a turn on this question? If so, I'll, I'll move on to question two. Ben? What's that? In, adding, in terms of adding more to the question or have more to say? Yeah, if you have more to say, go ahead. Otherwise, let's go to the next okay, question. Okay, gotcha. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, let's go to the next question. Um, next question is, let me pull it up here. Okay, we should, this is from Hendrix. It says, uh, you should never show weakness before anyone, especially unbelievers. Okay. All right, Ben, will you go first? Uh, no, because I'm putting in the question. Uh, I, I need a little bit more time, so I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, let's have Steve go first then. Um, so we shouldn't show any weakness, especially in front of unbelievers. That was the question, right? Yeah, I, I think so. I'd... Okay. Okay, I was just just making sure um, that that I had it right. Um, hmm. Uh, that's a tough one because I think um, I, I think that can be yes and no. Um, uh, I think it depends upon each situation that, that you're in and um, that uh, we can be weak and, and God still be strong. But I also see examples of strength in believers in the face of, of, uh, of their, of, of the lost and those that one might consider an enemy. Um, depending on the situation, um, if you're in front of a, of a, of a person who's possessed, I would think you would need to be strong in Christ and, you know, uh, not, not have, not, not, not be all timid and weak, you know, in that, um, to know that. You need not fear. So, uh, but there's a difference between fear, weakness, and knowing that we're weak as humans without God. So, uh, to be vulnerable perhaps might be another thing, but that you know, it just depends on on the situation. Can you can you grieve with a lost person that has just lost someone? Some might consider that weakness. I don't know. I, I don't. I'm, I wouldn't say that that's weak to grieve with someone. That you know that kind of a thing. So it, it's a complicated question, actually. I would say. I think it depends upon the situation, and you know, really needs more. Uh, need, that could be a whole Bible study in itself. 
uh, to show different examples of different situations where you should appear strong and where you should allow uh, some vulnerability to be seen so that, you know, people, people know you're real. And I think that's, that's, that's true. Like Jesus wept, but he also drove out the money changers and stuff like that out of the temple. So that there's, there's some different, I think each situation needs its own, uh, answer with that question. Okay, thank you. I'll go next. I agree with you. It, it does depend upon the, the situation, but I, I said certainly false uh, be, because it, it's that rule that I, uh, I keep applying to these questions. Uh, when there's an absolute, I, I tend to be uh, uh, against it. It says you should never show weakness. Now, uh, obviously, it's, it's a wonderful testimony if we're showing strength as we're being burned at the stake instead of weakness, uh, that that's really what uh, would be wonderful for the world to see. Uh, but uh, does that mean that you 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 have to do that? You've, we're still human beings with our weaknesses and our frailties, and and uh, we we suffer pain and fear. So uh, uh, I would say that um, yeah, if, if we can be an example of courage and being that that is showing our confidence in our our um, promised salvation then uh, that's a, a, an ideal thing but if a person doesn't do that uh, it just shows that they're a you know a frail weak human being and uh, uh, so I, I I would say certainly false because of the word never um, all right uh, who wants to go next I can go, I guess. Um, yeah, I, I, I totally agree. Um, the I, I think um, there are times where you want to need to show weakness. Uh, in fact, I mean, it depends what weakness is too. Is that you could you, you could show your personal weakness or um, be weak to other believers so that you might win win some. You know, like Paul said. Um, so you know, I, I, there are times where I will will pur purposely be weak and show it and act like I'm well, not really. I mean, like, for example, I might, uh, you know, go to a concert to, with someone, a friend who I want to win over. Um, but something, you know, a concert might not be necessarily a, a music concert, might not be something I necessarily want to do anymore. Um, you know, but I, I will do that for the sake of, of uh, you know, being, being weak for, for uh, the sake of someone else. Um, but also, too, is um, just in, in, in even in my relation with, um, with one another. Uh, you know, I, I have very strong opinion with one another in terms of, of fellow believers. I have very strong opinions about certain things, and um, I, I do feel like you know sometimes I have to hold back or you know kind of pull back a little bit because some I know certain people are uh, have their um, distaste for certain things. Um, you know, everyone has their own little areas where they're sensitive to, or they don't like talking about it, or they they don't uh, they they you know they they hold a certain view, and so I, I'll I I know that there's no. And I know that person's not open to open or to considering something um, on, that I might have to say on that matter. I'll, I'll hold back. I'll be weak in that respect for the sake of of, of, of unity. And so, um, I, you know. But at the same time, um, if there's something very strong where I feel very strong about that, it can't be. I, I'm not willing to compromise about. Um, you know, I, I, it's sometimes you you do need to say, well, everyone needs to uh, grow up a little bit and. Uh, and and and, uh, and and you know, be tolerant of one another. Uh, we don't have to all have to agree on everything 100 percent of the time. I think the only thing that we really need to agree about is uh, the doctrine of salvation. I think that's really the only for me personally. That's the only thing I, I require. Uh, everything else is uh, totally uh, uh, open to discussion. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think I think there's uh, it's good to be weak and it's good to be strong. So, it depends on the situation. <laughs> Thank you. I, uh, I will amend your uh, statement, and I think you're going to agree that there's two things, not one, and that is, uh, who is Jesus, and, and how do I get saved? So um, those are the two things I think that we need to get right. Um, let me see. Okay, who hasn't had a turn? 
who has an attitude? I haven't. I won't take that long. Um, right. Right. Leaning, false. Uh, I think it depends on what it is, what it is we're talking about, what the situation is. You know, some of these true or false uh, questions are kind of cut and dry, and they just they're not that simple. So, um, you you could be weak, for example, in front of an enemy, and appear weak to them. Now, if we're not talking about a physical weakness. In other words, <laughs> you're not in a battle for your life, kind of thing, physically, hopefully. Uh, we would we'd be talking about something else, you know. Sometimes, you know, you might want to fake it till you make it in that kind of situation. But um, if your reliance is upon the Lord, then it really doesn't matter how you appear to others. And if He is, uh, hopefully, He is He is your God, and He's the one you're relying on in every situation and circumstance, then it really doesn't matter how you come off because it ain't about you. And the Lord may even allow you to appear weak to your enemies to deal with them when they try to reach for you to harm you. So uh, I've seen that happen. So that's what I'm saying. It depends on what we're talking about. But, you know, there's there's rare situations and circumstances where one thing or the other might apply. But, um, you know, if, if you're under the protection and and, you know, submitted to the authority of Christ, I don't see that in any situation it's going to be a problem where the Lord is not your defender, as the Bible says he will be. I mean, you could. there's times you could even be, now I don't recommend that you be in the wrong, but you could be in the wrong and the Lord still protect you because you're his child. So, you know, I, I that's why I say lean in, lean in false. And that's all I have to say. Hey. All right, uh, let me see. Who did we miss? Heather, did you want to? Or Angel? Oh, yeah. No, 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 Heather can go first. Yeah, that's not with me. You missed. I did okay. not go first. But uh -huh. hi, everyone. Brother Luke asked me hey. to use my camera tonight. So there you go. You get to Heather. see me. <laughs> don't don't mind the no makeup. Makeup is so 2019. <laughs> yeah, neither, uh, neither one of us have a makeup on tonight. Yeah, but I, I did have to. Brother, I brother didn't Luke perceive was, that, brother Luke. I'm sorry. I look like I got my makeup on after all. Yeah, you look good. You look good, brother. You. Brother Luke was sharing that he had an awesome new robe, and I actually have the twin to it over here. So maybe Hendrix isn't my twin anymore. Maybe brother Luke is. But right. um, yeah. Anyway, um. To answer the question, which I kind of forgot a little bit. <laughs> I forgot it too. Um, I answered leaning false. And um, can you remind me what the question was real quick? Yeah, it's, uh, if I can find it here. Um, you should never show weakness before anyone, especially unbelievers. Okay, yes. And actually, I was going to answer this one right after you did, Brother Luke, because I wanted to tie into something that you said. But new program and all, I accidentally hit the red button <laughs> and disconnected instead of the unmute button. Um, but I wanted to um, tie into what you were saying about testimonies. I, I believe that, well, I know from my own um, experience that God has brought me through a lot of things in my life. And um, part of my testimony is the weakness. And I know that God can use that and has used that to speak to other women who have been through situations similar to me. And um, for that reason, I would say yes, in, in certain circumstances, weakness is actually helpful when you're trying to minister to someone um i do i do agree that if you are fighting or you know rebuking spirits or coming against anything like that that strength is definitely required however that's not really my personality i'm i'm a, a pacifist for the most part um so in that case I need to rely on Jesus to be my strength in my moments of weakness. Awesome. Awesome. 
I loved your answer. Thank you, sister. All right, sister Angel, what do you say? I would say mostly false, just because for me, at least, I, I try to just focus more on being authentic than appearing one way or the other. I'm not a fan of showing weakness, whatever, you know, that's kind of an ill-defined word anyway, um, um, you know, because I get to find it a million different ways. But um, I think that uh, for for the most part, the best way to reach anybody or to, uh, uh, to win anybody's trust is to just be uh, sincere. So if that involves showing weakness, then so be it. Um, you know, as long as uh, as long as you're you're if you come off as though you really actually mean what you say and you have integrity and your actions match your words and all of that, I think that uh, I think that that's you know, uh, and sometimes that will involve showing vulnerability or weakness. Uh, you know, because if you're trying not to show weakness, that oftentimes does come off as very insincere. So I would say, uh, yeah, it's a most, uh, mostly false, uh, leaning false. Uh oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, got mute. I accidentally muted you, Luke. <laughs> I was trying to say that I liked your point about being, uh, just being a. Uh, what is it uh, yourself? What was, how did you phrase yeah, it? Yeah, authentic or yeah, sincere. Yeah. yeah, I think yeah. that probably is the key to the whole question, being authentic. But if you do show weakness, but it is authentic, I don't think we should worry about it or it should be any kind of an issue. Uh, there's nothing wrong with, with being weak. We are all weak if, if pushed far enough. I mean, they say that anybody will crack under enough torture. Uh, so... Yeah, be just be authentic. Good, good way of saying it. Uh, did everybody get a turn? All right then. Anyone? Anybody want to say more about this one? All right, Ben, you got another one for us. Oh, Ben. By the way, uh, I think uh, Matthew, uh, Rich Bob, he. Uh, he said that you haven't read any of the questions, um, the answers from the uh, chat room and their, their comments. Uh, he, he said, don't let Brother Luke go on without you getting a chance to do that. Okay, Did I I will do that. <laughs> well, okay. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll the last question. There was one response, but it was just quote, quote. And so there's nothing there at all. Let me look at the last one. Um, prior to that, let's see here. Um yeah, but, but okay, maybe there's something wrong with this, with the website because it, it. Oh, okay, here, my dear, here it is. Okay, so the the last question about the question of Job, someone says, it is merely anecdotal that he was false. Uh, it is possible, but James mentions Job in as a saint, so he felt he was real. And there is a Job mentioned in Genesis, but I believe Job was under the law, not not before the law or flood. I'm not sure what they're trying to say there. Um, so let me go to the last one, other one. Um, let's see here. Oh, there's much, much more here on this one. Um, someone says, God is our strength. When we in inevitably fail, we should try to make a show of God's strength in our stead. Another person says, by literal, by literal interpretation, it's false. But in reality, sometimes you need to show weakness. Other times, it's true that we should sh not show weakness. The Holy Spirit determines all things, and that was from Matthew. Another person says, We can never cover our weaknesses at all times. It is good display to, to display confidence as to post a weakness in general. It is also good to display humility, which some may consider a weakness, situationally. Um, another person says, Showing weakness to unbelievers I experience, I experience helps them to find their own humility. So that was all the responses that we received. Are we ready for the next question? Yeah, uh, but I, let me ask you, um, can you tell me the difference? Uh, could you define meekness? It sounds like weakness. Is it the same thing? Meekness? If that's in response to, I don't remember. Okay, if, it, if that's re in relation to the, the responses I just read, I don't think anyone said meekness there. But um, if you're saying... Someone in the chat room made a comment about meekness. Oh, um, well, I, I, I view meekness as a um, just a willingness to, to submit. That's how I see meekness. Mm -hmm. 
Hi guys, I I'm back. I don't know how well it's gonna work. I'm on an old computer, but I'm here. Sorry to interrupt. I made okay. it. Okay, awesome, awesome. Woo. Well, you're just you're just in time to answer the question. Uh, uh, is it? Uh, let me make sure I'm gonna read it right. I have to scroll way back to find it now. Uh, it, I got it. It's uh, the question okay. was. You you should never show weakness before anyone, especially unbelievers. True or false? False. Yeah. Well, we know I, we agree it's false, but you want to elaborate? Well, depends on what you mean as weakness. Weakness as in, I got a weakness for drinking. I'm just going to drink this fifth of whiskey. Yeah, you should probably not show that weakness or give in to that weakness. But when it comes to being weak as in, hey, I struggle with things too. You know, I have issues too. That just makes you on a level to empathize with other people. Um, and as far as unbelievers, we don't seek the counsel of the ungodly anyway. So I wouldn't go to an ungodly person with my weakness, uh, nor do I show my weakness to someone that I know could use it to destroy me. You know, so if it's the brethren, yeah, uh, we're supposed to be honest with one another. So we can help each other be lifted up. And his strength is perfected in our weakness. Amen. Hey, someone used a Bible verse. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Very good point, sister. Um, all right. Anybody want to say more about that question or should we move on? Brother Luke, um, I it's hard to switch back and forth between um, this, uh, this, this program and and YouTube, um, but I know you've got a computer there. Hendrix um, gave the definitions of meekness and weakness, and it's a really good comment. All right, you want to read it? I was actually kind of asking you too, because it's hard to switch back and forth. Oh, oh, okay. All right, let me see if I can find it here. Uh, Hendrix, Hendrix, I recognize that. Okay, Hendrix says, meekness equals restraint of power, Weakness equals vulnerability, imperfection. Yeah, uh, that's a good point. I, I to me, I, I've always defined meekness as power under restraint. So yeah, and power doesn't mean. I mean, meekness doesn't mean that you're a weak person and you have no power. It means that you control yourself and you hold yourself back. That's meekness. So uh, yeah, that's a very, very good point, Hendrix. Every once in a while, Hendrix uh, comes up with something really good. Every once in a while. Okay, Ben, how about the next question? All right, the next question is, uh, this is Heather's, um, says, since there's nothing to learn from the genealogy, again, true or false, um, true or false, since there's nothing to learn from the genealogies in the Bible, it's okay to skip those parts. Oh, wow. Let's let Sister Renee go first on this since she's been missing for a while. Sister, did you hear the question? Yes, I did. Uh, well, that's false. It doesn't say we shouldn't know or understand or study biblical genealogy. It teaches us history. But we're not to argue over genealogy or try to prop ourselves up because of our genealogy. Like uh, A lot of people try to do, I'm the real, I could trace my roots back to the real Hebrew people. You know what I mean? Like a lot of guys, like I know people that were secure in the faith, but now are Hebrew rooters and are trying to get everybody under the bondage of the food laws now because they think that their ancestors were Hebrew or Jewish. Uh, and then you've got people trying to uh, say, hey, I'm saved because I'm uh, of the line of so-and-so. I'm of the actual line of one of the 12 tribes. So I'm just automatically saved. And that aspect, genealogy is worthless. It has nothing to do with our genealogy. Our relationship with God has nothing to do with our genealogy. Our faith has nothing to do with it. It doesn't benefit at all, but it benefits to study the genealogies so that we can understand how God worked during that time. 
in our history. Yeah, very, very well said. So it doesn't benefit you as far as you are part of a genealogy. To, and you can say, look, look, this is my family line. I'm special. Uh, but it does, it is valuable and important to study it. So I'll give an example. Uh, the, the genealogy uh, is a way of proving that Jesus is the promised uh, Messiah Savior. You know, the, the, there are scriptures that, that say the Messiah will come from a certain um, descendants and they're listed. It says Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, Jesse, David. And then and Jesus, so uh, that shows you that not only is the word of God true and prophetic, and but uh, uh, Jesus is uh, without any doubt the promised Savior. Uh, okay, brother Steve. Okay, so the genealogy thing. Um, <clears throat> I would say. I think I agree a lot with what Renee said. Basically, um, it is important. It 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 shows us historically how Jesus. I think the most important thing is how how the fact that that shows the lineage of Christ. Uh, but uh, you know, you you can you could study that in in depth uh, for a long time. The words themselves, I have found out that. Uh, from others who have studied them far more deeply that, that if you uh, study the meaning of the words uh, of the names, that it, that it will tell the story of the gospel. Uh, and many of those, including town names, uh, there's uh, in acts uh, also does the same thing. So it's, it's, it's a good thing to study, but for, I would say for a, a babe in Christ, someone who is just born, born again, someone who is just uh, trusted in Christ as Savior, I would say that that's probably not the best place to start in study. Um, I would say the best place to start for a new believer would be books like John and Romans and, uh, you know, some of those, uh, maybe Psalms and Proverbs, but, uh, by and large, John and Romans, um, especially the Pauline, uh, letters, the Pauline epistles, uh, because Paul was the one who scripture specifically says was given the revelation of the mystery of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So to understand, uh, that, in more depth and detail, I think is uh, a very good place uh, to start. Uh, are the genealogies important? Yes. They wouldn't be in scripture if they weren't important. Uh, so, you know, th that's, that's basically what I'd say. When I was a younger, younger person and younger in the faith, yeah, I, I skipped them because I, you know, it was boring to me. So I wanted to get to stuff that, that I could understand more readily from scripture. And then also listen to people who talked about the genealogies that had done more study on it and could give me more insight and reason. And so, you know, with that in mind, you know, we, we learn from each other uh, because we're all different members, different parts of the body of Christ, that we each have different giftings and different different things that God shows us in his word. And so we should, you know, should listen, but always test whatever is being taught with anything. Excuse me. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, the, yeah, the genealogies are there and are important. They, they definitely tell uh, the lineage of Christ. And I think that's the most fundamental thing, uh, most fundamental, important thing. And you can learn things from it. Uh, for example, that, uh, that there were murderers and uh, at least one uh, female that, the, the Bible continually refers to as a harlot that was part of the lineage of Christ. And just to me further proves the fact that, that uh, Christ saves us despite our, our uh, failing, our sin and our flaws that uh, he can use anyone to accomplish uh, his work. Uh, if, if we are willing to be a part of it. And he'll use people even 
even when they're when they're not willing, you know, uh, I think God God makes His truth out there plain because you know that's just what he what he does, um, and it's not against their free will. It's just God's 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 pretty cool. God's pretty God is sovereign, and He will make sure the truth of the gospel and of God is available to all. And oh. so, yeah, genealogies are good. Thank you, brother. Uh, well said. I, I like your uh, recommend, recommended list of, of Bible books. Good choices. Uh, yeah, there's a lot to be learned from, from it, actually. Uh, uh, I have caught myself in the past speed reading through them, though. But um, I don't remember where it is, but maybe someone here can tell us. There, there is a genealogy where the, the, the name of the person, uh, you know, all the names of the Bible have a meaning. Like, uh, you know, uh, Jacob means trickster. And uh, and uh, I think Esau means red or hairy or something. But so there, for some reason, the, the, the names in the Bible are always very descriptive of who the person is. But there is a, a series of names in the Bible. And if you read them in order and just, and just read what the word their name means, You've got the gospel message. Uh, Someone can probably tell us where that is. Um, all right, who would like to go next? I'll go next. All right. Uh, yeah, I would say it's certainly very important. I remember doing the same thing when I was growing up as a teenager. When I, <laughs> I think when I got to Leviticus, I wanted to skip all of the, the laws and stuff. And uh, and and some of the other thing I think I skipped Leviticus and Deuteronomy <laughs> for a while, and then also uh, when you got to the genealogies, uh, I did the same thing. I'm like, this is boring. I want to know about, <laughs> more about Jesus. So I kind of stuck with the New Testament when I was much younger. But I would say they're certainly important because they tell us not only of as you guys said. So astutely the lineage of Christ, and we see some very wonderful things even in that, as Steve pointed out, but also it tells us about who's who even in the last days, because many of these people are still around. I mean, take, for example, I keep trying to point out that Ashkenaz is of the lineage of Japheth, and Japheth is a Gentile. <laughs> so... It's very important that we study these things and understand who's who. Otherwise, as I keep pointing out, you're going to be looking at the wrong people in the last days. That's not what you want to be doing because Israel is God's timepiece. And if you're looking at the wrong people, you're looking at the wrong timepiece. All right. But um, if you study it out, like, for example, with Gog and Magog, those people are still around today. So it's very important for us to go back and look and see who these people are. And the Bible tells us. And it also tells us even more about these people in the Apocrypha, which is why I argue it should never have been removed. From me. It should be in there. So uh, agreed. It is important. And we should study these things. And that's all I'm going to say about it. You're muted, Brother Luke. I guess I'll go next. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I was muted. I said something so profound, but now I'm not going to share it with anyone. All right, Brother Ben, go ahead. Yeah, I I, I would concur with, with with what everyone has said so far. You know, again, they, they prove the, uh, that Jesus is the Son of God uh, and the rightful heir to uh, David's throne, uh, etc., but one one thing that is curious, um, and I, there's something to this, but I don't think this person has it completely figured out. Uh, I even I hesitate, I hesitate to say his name, but I'm not again. I'm not I'm not afraid to, uh, you know. I, I'm, I'm it is what it is. So uh, you probably guys have heard heard of Harold Camping, the person that uh, I think pr prophesied or so to speak uh, falsely that the end of the world or Armageddon was going to happen. in, I can't remember what year he said it was going to happen, but he put billboards up. He was the very very old man, a uh, very uh, feeble old man, um, and a very deep voice. Um, and he, a lot of people, uh, a lot of people actually uh, believed him, and they sold everything they had, and um, it didn't come to pass. Anyway, I'm not suggesting that he was right at all, but um, 
Well, he did come up with an interesting theory, and there's something to it, but again, I don't think he's got it completely figured out. But he did, he, he has this book called Adam, it's called Adam Wynn, a Adam Wynn question mark. And it's basically trying to try to figure out uh, when, when did Adam uh, exist uh, and try to figure out um, the, a chronology of biblical events. Um, and again, I'm not saying for an instant that he's got it all figured out or that I'm 100% behind this, but there is something to it. I know, I do know that. Um, and what he basically says is that uh, the 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 not only the uh, genealogies genealogies that are listed in the Bible because I, I think it's it's pretty clear that the, the genealogies in the Bible are not uh, comprehensive. They don't include everyone, um, and um, and and so it's very sele it's selective um, in in, in their, its retelling. Even even in the Gospels, they they leave out certain names, um, and uh, but what he suggests is. The names that are listed and the and the and the and the person because in the Bible in, in the early chapters of Genesis in particular it talks about uh, not only someone begetting a, a person but uh, it uses two different words sometimes it uses a word I can't remember exactly the details but it uses a certain word to, to indicate that that person actually was the direct descendant and act you know in other words the, the that person fathered this child but it also uses a different word that could mean that the person uh, being referred to was not a direct descendant, but he was in the line of that patriarch. And I, I think there, I, I, again, it's been several years since I studied this, but I, I think there is something that that's not all that controversial. Um, and what he suggests is when it uses the word that doesn't mean directly begat, but it talks about the, 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 that it's a uh, distant descendant, when it mentions that person, because again, it's very selective, it's basically indicating that um, that person was birthed the year that that patriarch died. And it was an ancient way of record, it was an ancient calendar. So uh, it, it's an ancient way of, of calculating things. And it's very, it, it, there's something to this because um, it does make a lot of sense for one. Um, and number two, uh, there's a, there's a, like a passage in Genesis, for example, um, that talks about um, it talks about uh, Levi, and it talks about Levi having a son called Kohath, and Kohath the gate uh, had a son named Abram and Aaron, and it talked so it talked and again I'm not but may not be saying that exactly, but for each each of those people are descendants of each other, and and it's very again it's very peculiar why it's very selective in mentioning these people, and not only not only selective. But it, it also gives their their the number the the years that they lived, and if you add up all those years, so it says so for example Levi uh, lived for seventy seven years in Egypt. Kohath, well, either way, uh, if you add up these dates, it, it equals exactly four hundred thirty years, which is the exact number of years that they were in Egypt. Um, and again, it's very peculiar, very strange. It seems almost too coincidental. And again, I'm not doing a poor job of explaining it, but there could be something again with these gene genealogies where they're more than simply um, direct descendants. It's actually a way of how people in the ancient world, and there again, there is a parallels in, in other cultures that did these similar things, where how this is how they recorded time. Um, and I, I one one thing that um, in one way, one of the things he mentioned, for example, is that you know we say uh, this is twenty the year. Uh, 2020, and we say AD. So in it, it, we so it's in it's in relation to Christ's uh, generation, and so uh, he again he kind of made that same case that we do that today even to some extent, and uh, that's how they did it in the ancient world. Um, so it was very interesting, just something to think about. Um, and I, I did study this pretty uh, exhaustively, and I found some things that were very uh, very interesting, and I think beyond coincidence. But and I did a poor job of explaining it. So I, if you want to interested, I'd recommend you read it yourself. It's a free PDF that you can get online. You, you can find it. Um, and uh, again, I don't agree with everything, but I think there is something to it. So very interesting if you're curious about that kind of thing. Okay, thank you. All right, Sister Heather posted a link to a video that talks about the meaning of the all the names in the Bible, I guess. So, Heather, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, it's the meanings of the names from Adam to Jesus. And it's it's what we've been talking about that um, it tells the story of the gospel. Well, that's quite a coincidence, isn't it? No, I don't believe in coincidence, sir. I believe in God incidents. 
<laughs> okay. I do too. <laughs> okay. Uh, who's next? Uh, has everybody answered this? Uh, I, I'll just quickly. I mean, I, I concur with everybody. Everybody's pretty much covered everything I could even possibly think of to, to say about the subject. I think, uh, that uh, the, uh, one thing I will add is that there's a danger in uh, in people studying their own genealogies. Uh, I know so a lot of times people do that just to kind of push the, puff themselves up. Although I mean it is interesting, um, but uh, uh, I'm I'm pretty sure that pretty sure that especially like is what, what Renee was saying that there's a a real danger when it comes to trying to tie yourself back to um, one of the uh, the houses or the tribes. I mean people people take this this pride in their uh their bloodline or their race or whatever and they 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 you know it that that's, that's the kind of knowledge that puffs you up and everything and i but i do think that god intended it for something else and what ben said uh, about timekeeping and oh i think there's probably a lot of mysteries to unlock when it comes to the genealogy so but i'll, I'll leave it at that I don't want to beat a dead horse mm -hmm. well, thank you uh i i know that uh Mormons, they they are really into genealogies, not Bible genealogies, but their own family genealogies. I think they've got the largest uh, library or collection of genealogies in the world. So uh, they they really think that tracing, tracking your genealogy is important. I think it is interesting because I've had time myself, me and Renee are related distantly and um, my my husband and I have a lot of interesting parallels, but it's, it, you know, it, it, I think uh, there's some vanity in all of this uh, 23 and Me stuff now where they have everybody trying to do it like all the time with their uh, DNA and everything like that. So, but, uh, but anyway, that, that's not it. <laughs> you know, I, I thought that you and Renee were probably related because you, you look so much alike. Uh, I noticed that each of you have two eyes and one nose. <laughs> I, mm. I, I knew, I felt like we were related when I first saw her, actually. So it's funny mm -hmm. that we are. Two, two eyes and one nose. I was trying to get back to my thing because I was joking. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> Renee, so another thing. Did, did you ever notice that Heather's nose is like yours? It's in the center of your face? Yes, that is so bizarre. Hey, yeah. I bet you were related. <laughs> Yeah, you know what though, genealogy. I'm glad Paul put that verse in, you guys, because like I said, this gentleman that I met, he was on the right path, complete in Christ, uh, believed in uh, the gospel of grace. But the minute I, I see, I don't even know if he really he's adopted, so I don't even know if he really did this genealogy thing, or if he just decided he wanted to say he was a Hebrew or a Jew. But ever since then, he has left the soundness of the simple gospel and has gone into all these crazy Old Testament doctrines because of genealogy. And we see Jesus saying, or was it was actually John the Baptist that said, think not unto yourselves that you have Abraham as your father. Abraham could raise up children from these stones. So apparently genealogy was something they assumed brought them salvation automatically. And that's something they had to repent of. So I'm actually glad he mentions uh, to not, you know, rest on that or to uh, make that a, a place of division. But just like anything in scripture, it can be taken too far. You know, I'm glad you that you guys come up with these questions because just because of that verse, some people would say, oh, I can skip over all the genealogy. And like everybody's pointed out and Nori pointed out in there. It, no, we have to know the genealogy to confirm Jesus is the heir of David, who is to sit on the everlasting throne. Because if if not, then and he had children, <laughs> then they are the heir of David and not him. So it's. It's good, you know. We see how this works. I agree. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Heather. I I agree. I am actually very fascinated by the genealogies, and I, much like a couple of my other brothers and sisters, was bored to tears with them as a kid. Um, I skipped past them. I like totally routed around them, whatever I needed to do, because if I read them, they put me to sleep. But since I have 
learn the truth of the gospel. And I have, um, I have started studying my Bible in depth. I have found so much, so many nuggets of gold in that genie, in those genealogies. Um, like somebody said earlier, Rahab, um, was an outcast and Ruth was a Gentile beyond being a Gentile. She was from a pagan culture. And if God can use them, God can use me. You know what I mean? God can use you. And just, it, it, it fascinates me. It really does. And the meaning of the names, the story that it gives. And I, I tried to remember, I couldn't remember, but I found the video. So you guys should definitely watch that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's amazing. I love it. And I, I, regardless, we are all related <laughs> because we all came from Adam and Eve who came from God. So um, we are all related, but um, I just, I, I find it fascinating. Yeah, it is fascinating. And, and the things you call God incidences, <clears throat> uh, most people haven't studied it to uh, re realize the, how amazing it is, <clears throat> but all those things, they make me suspect the Bible is the inspired word of God. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. The, the other interesting thing I heard, uh, I, I think it's true, um, is that uh, you know the, the Jews kept uh, very copious uh, genealogies. And when the temple was destroyed in AD 70, those were destroyed. All the genealogy destroyed. So no one could come forth now and say and prove that they were... Of, the, of their genealogy that would be the rightful heir to David's throne because that was destroyed in 70 AD. I think that's interesting. The other thing, um, I, I, yeah, I do know the Mormons also, uh, again, like you said, they, they were kind of at the forefront of all this, uh, this uh, you know, the, the, a lot of the genetic technology because they, um, they wanted to trace their ancestry. And I, I don't know if it has something to do with they want to pray or baptize the dead or something. I don't know if anyone knows more about that, but that's kind of bizarre. Mm -hmm. oh and something else i wanted to mention and i'm sorry and i forgot was um i i love that renee brought up where john the baptist talked about that god could raise up descendants from for abraham from the rocks because that's exactly what he did god raised up the gentiles us from the rocks from no no lineage and made us children of abraham through through Jesus. And I think that I love that, that you said that Renee. Yeah. Well, he did make us out of the rocks or at least the dirt. Right. Originally. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Any more on this question? I, I think look, we're, we're running uh, the, at our getting close to our ending time. So I, I guess we ought to, unless you want to say more about this question, start uh, summing things up. Heather. I was just going to say the atheists that believe uh, we just spontaneously grew out of pond scum. Well, they think rocks are our actual cousins because inanimate objects and inanimate matter. We all just spontaneously uh, sprung life from nothing. So a rock could actually be our long lost great grandfather. Mm -hmm. According to their theory, no, 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 no. Yeah, see no. how insane it all sounds so smart until you really understand what they're saying. It, it's so it's so ridiculous and not possible when you break down uh, the atheist actual belief system. Yeah, but their part about us coming from the rocks is actually true. You know how, oh, yeah, how sure. God made Adam that way. Yep. We all share the same elements. That's yeah. right. And we turn back into dirt. But in That's, some right. <laughs> That's right. That's <clears> right. <throat> all right. Um, okay. It's uh, almost nine, which is almost midnight uh, on the East Coast. So uh, it's time for us to start closing up here. Uh, let's start giving our summary remarks. <clears throat> um, let's start. Uh, Brother Steve, why don't you give us your uh, thoughts on the discussion tonight? Um, uh, I'm glad to be here. Uh, the, the, uh, the genealogy one was, was really a good one to me. 
I think that's probably my my favorite question of the of the evening um with that because of how uh deep God's word can take you and I not just the the names of things that tell a story when you look up the meaning of the names but also uh we don't know how how deep that truly goes because I know that uh that even the individual letters tell stories um uh Jehovah or Jehovah, Y H W H, um, Jehovah. Uh, uh, those letters spell out. Behold, the, or when 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 the meaning is looked up, it 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 says, "Behold the hands, behold the nails." So that's that's just one example and i know the the word for uh in the beginning in the beginning <laughs> in genesis the word that says in the beginning uh when you look up those letters it tells uh the story too so there's so much that can be gleaned that we don't even you know you know have the have the first clue of i've i've uh you know read of of many scholars that have been asked the question you know that have studied scripture all their life and they'll say things like uh you know if they're asked the question how much of the bible do you know or you know uh, do you think you understand it all yet and uh one of the most uh, amazing answers i heard or read actually would be I've studied the Bible long enough to know that if I studied, if I had 10 more lifetimes, a hundred more lifetimes, I still would not have enough time as a human man to exhaust what is in scripture to study. So with, with that, uh, you know, point that I kind of, I say that with the genealogy stuff that it's amazing how deep the the study goes but it also to me also bears light on the the initial conversation that we had um and that uh you know we we just haven't exhausted it and you know we could we should be able to continue to have discussions like that uh and and maybe we can in another couple of weeks or something uh but uh, that would on a different night when it's not the fun fun night cuz that's a th- those are deep discussions to me and uh I'd like these nights to be fun um but that's just that's that's just me the the latter questions were were more fun to me so than the than the start so i'll let that be my answer and god bless everyone uh the gospel that saves you from the punishment of the lost from from that is jesus christ died for your sins and he was buried and he rose again believe in that you're saved from all in any punishment of the uh, of the lost that that because you sinned and fell short of the glory of God, um, that you need a redeemer. And that is Christ, the Messiah. Mm-hmm. Thanks. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, Brother Ben, give us your uh, summary remarks. Thank you, Ben. All right, Sister Angel. Oh, sorry, guys. All right. Yes, um, I'm getting I'm getting pretty exhausted, but uh, I'm I'm glad I got here uh, without too much time passing, so to where I wasn't totally uh, totally just uh, lost because um, I guess I, I guess you guys started pretty late tonight anyway. But um, 
yeah, I had a, a really, uh, really good night tonight. I guess uh, we'll be seeing you tomorrow night on the uh, on a late night with Lisa and friends, right, Lisa? Oh, where is she? I don't see her. She gone? I saw her there? leave. She might have dropped out. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, well. Uh, hopefully she'll come back before we're done here. But otherwise, yeah. uh, hope, hopefully see you guys tomorrow night. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you you plugged the the program. That's good. <laughs> All right, Sister Heather. What do you say? Yeah. Um. When uh when Steve was talking about um the things that that um uh, um like that you can find in the Bible, it, it's it is amazing to me. Um, like, for example, the fact that the Israelites, when they moved through the wilderness, moved in the shape of a cross. I That completely flabbergasted me. And there's so many reflections of, of Jesus and the cross throughout the Old Testament and in in the genealogies and in, in, in well, in everything. Um, that's that's written in the Bible. And like I said, I don't believe in coincidence. I believe in God incidents. And I believe even things that that um, we see today in, in our lives, God puts those there for a reason. And I, I don't know necessarily what those reasons are, but I have come through too many things in my life to look at something and say it was a coincidence. So um yeah, but I, I did, I had a good time tonight. Um, I enjoyed the true false questions. Um, and I look forward to possibly being able to stay up tomorrow to watch y'all talk. Um, I don't know, that gets really late for a mommy with a three-year-old who who likes to get up at 7 a.m. We'll see. Oh yeah, I know. I know how you feel. <laughs> it's really yeah, late but I, too, I but... do try and catch y'all on repeat when I can though. Oh yeah, that's probably that's probably better for better for a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, we go pretty late. Uh, Lisa's on uh, California time, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Sister Heather. All right, Sister Renee, I'm so glad you could uh, end up coming back. Uh, give us your uh, thoughts on the discussion tonight. Yeah, I, I'm glad I could get back. This this old PC is really slow. I think it's just got it's just old. And uh, I'm so sorry about interrupting when I had to leave and come back in. I'm so sorry. Um, but I will be on Sister Lisa's program tomorrow night also at 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's 11, right, guys? 11 p.m. Eastern Standard yeah, Time yeah. Uh, on Sister Lisa's channel tomorrow. <laughs> Continuing from last week. I'm glad she reminded me. Um, but... I, I think it's good we have these discussions. You know, normally I know we usually do the true false questions and that is just a really fun time. But I, I was interested in the conversation earlier. I think it's it's good we discuss these things. Um, eschatology is not my uh it's not my focus of study either. I I only know the dispensationalist view and I know that like the back of my hand. But because I you know, I'm not sure of my stance on some of it. I'm not willing to teach on it, you know, because I, uh, I don't agree with everything that I was taught. And I was taught this, you know, uh, very clear dividing everything's futuristic. So I enjoy, uh, hearing other ideas and it's, it's never wrong to consider or think outside the box. I hope nobody thought that we were saying that it is always good to keep your mind open set aside tradition and be willing to let the scripture say what it says and let and let god speak to you and to think differently and to discuss these things it's important that we do that so i i had a good time uh surprisingly these true false questions they can really get deep sometimes you know even the genealogy question it's important and i always learn something from you all and uh, i enjoy hanging out with you so thanks for having me okay all right thank you sister all right well uh, we had a, a good uh, crowd in the chat room and uh, it was quite uh, they were quite involved in, in the discussion so thank you for that everybody 
and uh, everybody on the panel, appreciate you being here. And I know we, we veered from our normal, uh, uh, you know, program, uh, the way we normally conduct things, but I thought it was uh, important for us to uh, discuss that. Uh, but I did like in getting in, into the questions because this is, we call it fun fellowship Friday. So uh, I hope we can keep it that way. All right. Thank you. Um, so don't forget to join uh, uh, Lisa's channel tomorrow night, 11 p.m. for the Most High Jesus. Uh, and uh, Sunday, of course, 5 p.m. Eastern on this same channel, Church of the Eternally Secure. We have our Sunday church service. If you haven't joined us before, please join us this Sunday. All right. Thank you all. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior, God, Jesus.